Hello and most welcome to 966. This is advancing in a speed that has not happened before in our series. We are already 66 episodes ahead. And I don't know what we should do when we reach the millennia. It is coming steadily closer and closer. Uh, another thing that is progressing is like the different part of the lecture series seem to interpenetrate. They get nesting into each other so as to further the effect. I can show here different areas that I saw to be completely different and not really consistent with each other. This I found on the way in here. Heidegger and the contradiction of being. <coughs> and we also have Swedish book, uh, The Road to the Master Memory by Matthias Ribbing seem to have something to do with something completely different. No connection whatsoever. And then we have our good old friend Pedro de Alcantara, the excellent writer. It's a delight to read him, but also an Alexander teacher and a musician. How does these come together? But I do actually now. And I will try to put some energy in explaining that today. And I also got inspiration from a meeting yesterday at the Catholic Church here, where we had a fantastic lecture by uh, Pater Thomas, or Father Thomas from Stockholm. I was very impressed by his energy and his skill in argumenting. But there were also some things that made me curious. Not critical, but curious. And you see, everything can open up. All sorts can contribute to knowledge. And I am accepting it as it is, uh, which makes it so interesting. Today's lecture is named Sameness and Difference. Alternatively, Sameness and Difference. Alluring a bit to the Derridian expression, Difference. That is uh, an allusion to both, both differ, a differ maybe in French, which is not being at the very same time, and difference, not being at the same spot, or being not alike. Those things are very interesting, and I got a great help there by Rodolphe Garcia, who's still very different from uh, what I read before from uh, Derrida, I mainly focused on the interpreters of uh, Gayatri Spivak, uh, Plotnitsk, Arkady Plotnitsky, uh, Robert Magliola I read before, but the second read I really got into it much more. It wasn't possible for me to go into the book before 200%. I realize now but I did not realize it then. I thought I had the, all the ideas clear. And this is something I am hinting to. Let's start. And now you will understand more clearly why Susie Froebel is so important. I will put a statement here. And that is why the body and the soul from a fractal viewpoint is the same but also different in working principle. And this idea I got from yesterday from Father Thomas's uh, grand lecture, and it was that I had a feeling he sort of didn't make any difference between soul and spirit, or sorry, soul and body. How weird, how could I get that impression? Isn't that very odd? Well, it seemed to when he was talking, and that's not only him, actually it was his manner of being very expressive that sort of knocked on my head to something I, underneath my consciousness, have been thinking for a very long time. And that is, if you make a polarity like René Descartes between body and soul, you sort of, on the surface, gain 
a very clear difference between something that is soul, spiritual, mental, psychic, and you can make a difference to the body, the lower thing or the thing of the world. That's the first take. But if you go deeper down, if you do a deconstruction, it does start to seem there are tendencies that are pointing to the absolute reverse. By not making a deeper difference, we lose out on our understanding power what really, deep down in the fractality, are different between body and soul. You sort of make a superficial difference between the two parts and thereby loosening or loosen, we lose out on the details. Remember, fractality is all about the details. It is so very different and details is also energy, it's direction, it's what makes the firm, the Urmbunke stable. It's not, not there by happenstance, it's not random. The same goes for rest of reality, of course. Everything is fractal. And if we make too much of a difference early on, at the very first take, it can seem that I'm very decisive. I could, for instance, say that there's two persons coming in here, and uh, I say, one is Norwegian, one is Swede. And at first take, that could be a good thing, but that could also block out the differences in between them. It, I, get like a category early on and then I can't really as easily see who they are, what they stand for. And this is a known problem in biology. If you're too quick to put something into a category, you can actually be the losing person when it comes to difference, to making categories. And this has happened so many times in biology. And I think somewhere in the back of my head, maybe in this part, that was lingering on. I was studying extensively biology in the late 90s and I love those problems with uh, when you make a decision wrong somewhere early, to early on in biology and you put something into the wrong category. How hard it is to fix and how much you are sort of losing out on. And one of those interesting things is marsupials and mammals. That has that's a division like this, we call these marsupials and we call these mammals. And that has also caused us not to understand our underlying important difference. Mammals on one side, marsupials on one side. And we are now changing our position after a lot of time. We've been looking at what you could call superficial differences. And now we Thanks to putting them into the same category, we are able to fine tune. Because now we can compare. We can compare each marsupial to another marsupial. That wasn't really possible in the same way. And we can also compare marsupial to mammal. But they are much closer together than we thought, let's say, 50 or 60 years ago. When we thought this was such a big difference. Marsupial. Of course, it is somebody that carries their babies, not in the womb, but uh, in a sort of a, I don't know what's called in English, but uh, a sack, let's call it a sack. Uh, that difference is not so strict, but this also blocks out other differences. Now, when they're put into the same category, more or less, we can also more clearly discern differences to non-mammals like lizards, tortoises, fish, so forth. And this has contributed a great deal. Somebody would rake, reach uh, his or her hand and say, but that could have been done already when you're sitting at the table 50, 60 years ago. <sighs> Possibly, but I really doubt it. You need to get into the grit. And once the mistake is done, it's even harder to sort of fix it on the table, on the desk. It needs to be done before.
And here is the similarity why doing the Cartesian cut could actually take away our powers of discerning the differences between soul and body. So we don't see the finer filigrane fractal differences. And we start thinking about the soul like a sort of needless body with urges. And I would say this actually lowers our expectations on the soul, makes it a little bit ruled by instinct, like our body is usually in this division. this division Cartesian division is like this body here soul here and all of a sudden because the soul is defined by, by what it is not it's not the body this is the problem with this thing a problematic you need to understand it this is useful but if it's on such a high level, it is problematic because all of a sudden we define the soul in what it is not. It is like the soul is no longer freestanding. And that's the whole idea of deconstruction. We don't let the words be individuals. And that is why I call the lecture sameness and difference because they are not really Contagonists, they're rather brothers. And if you take away sameness, somehow you also take away difference. Yes, it's odd, but that is what makes deconstruction so utterly interesting. To make it something that not only changes what I have around me, but also what I have inside of me. Because I am in on this. I do this. I could say, I could point to Descartes and say, he did it. But that wouldn't be entirely true. I have to do it each and every time. And I realize I could actually rethink this. And all of a sudden, I get soul, mental, psyche aspect that is much more interesting. It's much more fractal. It's much more active as well. And all of a sudden, I also understand soul in this manner is of lower quality as the body is. We lose out on both ends. But not doing the polarity or the binary opposition at an early stage, so to speak, or preemptive even, which Descartes did, we can find finer and finer details. And this is actually very, very close to the coastline of Norway. So happy with this metaphor. <laughs> because if we lower the polarity, we say that it shouldn't be one kilometer. So everything that's above one kilometer, we can count. Everything that's below, we count. We count not going on zooming in so to speak we get more complexity we go down to 500 meters of course the coastline would be enormous it would cover the well at least our solar system but you gain so much complexity you would learn more about the generalities of the norway coastline and very good example here. I understood by this, uh, when I heard the example many years ago, two things at one go. Callis' favorite expression, kill two birds with one stone. I learned about fractality, I learned about complexities, but I also learned that there is an actual case that the coastline of Africa is less fractal. It is definitely less fractal. It is not a general example. Africa is almost cursed by having too little fractality. What would that cause? Well, it would cause a problem with having natural harbors. Um, artificial harbors need to be constructed to a very great price. Of course, there are uh, probably some uh, uh, 
advantages to this but there is an effect on the weather which is not to the advantage of Africa. There is a reason why Africa is not that densely populated. I think it's one of the continents uh, excluding Australia which is the least populated and it's the lack of complexity make for a weather that's more predictable. More predictable means less variation. Less variation in the millennia means less vegetation. And Africa has very little vegetation. It is mostly savanna, desert or barren areas, what we call steppe or taiga. Those are no good for agriculture. Actually, should you be very harsh, you can only find free for areas that are good for agriculture. The Nile being a decisive one, and Ethiopia to some extent. And that also has an historical effect. Uh, it was only, so to speak, in Egypt, in Ethiopia, maybe Sudan, the Sudan, where you find high cultures, because you need you need sort of natural hydration uh, and you need a good soil good soil you get from having vegetation before and that's a second take i realized so you see here by zooming in in my mind this zoom was done in my mind on this side on the hand side of the whole thing and all of a sudden i realized it is true and no study of any map could have given me that information and that goes to show by not doing the Cartesian cut preemptively, we can actually gain and understand more of the more specific and interesting differences between the soul and the body. And we can also see them as the same. In one way, they are absolutely the same because every time I take in space, I get more balance and my mind becomes more clear. That clearance is my horizon. This is what I need to understand a book. And I will gain more understanding from any book, any encounter with another person, something on the internet, something on the radio, something I experience. For every step I go down the fractality. Isn't that wondrous? So I show a fantastic sameness, but there is more to be gained. Killing two birds in one stone. This is actually the case of killing two birds in one stone. It is maybe too much. It's having like a big cake and then you have dessert after the cake and then you have something else sweet. It's too much as it did for me yesterday when I was overeating on the wondrous cake. Uh, I think that's a very good example of fractality. In the beginning people said it's too little cake. So everyone stopped to eat cake. You can say that the fractality went up and the divisions we made they were like cruder. They were not as specific. So mm -hmm. you just cut yourself a very thin slice of everything. And what happened in the end? A huge amount of cake was left because we lost the specificity. We made too early, or you could say too early on polarization. And that meant there was a lot of cake left in the end. Some of the cake went here, I'm afraid. But, well, I feel a bit guilty, but I got a really good example here. I think you understand better here that this is a tool that we can use. We can go up and down the scale and all of a sudden, what happens when we do this? We interact. Our thinking skill is not passive. It sends something out. Just like the eye is sending things out. One uh, great picture in the book of Susie Froebel Fractal time shows all the illustrations of people looking and there's always a beam coming out of their eyes. People had, before everything was established, uh, before things became 
ontic. There was a freedom to perceive it that way, which is the more natural way. We need to send something out to get something in return. And it's not so much, to exaggerate a bit, it's not so much exactly what we send out, it's the complexity of it. And I would say the complexity is the why question. That's the only question. Why question is the more complex question, whereas the what question is further up the scale and it's preemptively block out opportunities. Then you already decided on what level you should see the world. It should be at this level and then we only have certain zooming in to do. And that blocks preemptively and unnecessarily in some cases out the complexities and in some cases by defining what is marsupial or what is mammal we are asking a what question and what people did is a why question why do the marsupial not carry their babies in their womb that was a more important question and more or less by asking that one we understood something that we never would have been able to reach otherwise. We understood that marsupials are not that much more, well, what can you say, down the scale, not as primitive. There are actually very good reasons not to carry their babies in the womb. I won't go into those, but that understanding would have been blocked if we kept to the old division. So you see here, by, because this is a deconstruction in biology, it's even called the deconstruction in biology. And I think those people that called it that way are not really aware about Derrida. But the word has spread out by itself. So people understand more or less what deconstruction is. And that was, that made possible for a deepening of understanding. Something I got from Susie Frobel, her Delta T depth when we deepen in time and make more complexities possible. Delta T, depth. And all of a sudden we can have many things at the very same time. And that's another advantage. Uh, earlier that would be, when I was in university, it would have been when I studied linguistics to say, you can have two absolute meanings at the very same time. Then what people will start to laugh. We know that to be a very decisive case of reality. You can have two decisive meanings at the very same time. And that actually enforce the different meanings. Without this nullification that Rudolf Gashir is talking about. We don't have this direct reflection. We have a deeper reflection. And this is the nested reflection, where meaning feeds into meaning, where understanding feeds into understanding. So delta T depth is, and this is incredibly odd to say, this is a real depth. Because you can see the qualities, you can actually count on it if you want to, and there is products. Whereas, sorry Descartes, but the free dimension of oversimplification doesn't give any real effects to speak of. Only on the paper, and we use it as a tool, which is okay. But don't use this as to preemptively block out possible knowledge, like with the marsupial and the mammal. You are more than welcome to use it when it's necessary, but don't feel preemptively obliged to do it. Because once you understand, you can choose. All of a sudden, activation comes into the game. Intention comes into the game. And this is also 
solving, I started early on taking space. And all of a sudden I realized, well, in a way I could have made that more convincing. Now we did it anyway, which is good. Doing it is very good. But for a broader audience, we can use fractality to, to explain that the very idea of preemptively think, thinking of your body as an ontic limitation before you even got into experience. That will, in the same way as soul and body, block out both soul and body. But understanding everything is fractality, is opening up to complexity, to a deeper understanding, and also to intelligence. Because this doesn't make so much intelligence. Everyone can do that. It's still useful in some cases. But it's not the only mode of being. And uh, of course we already worked with this for the 900 episode. It seems like the very first step is the hardest step here. It's very hard to question three dimensions because it's been established for millennia. And it's so downrooted in our inner soul. So that was needed 900. But now I feel everything is going faster, sounds stressful, but I would say it is progressing on a level that is more uh, rapid without putting in the idea of stress here. This is a block, it's very hard to go around and it's literally a block as well. <laughs> and to be friends with it and still accept it as uh, a thing that you can use sometimes is also hard because by criticizing, which I think you have to do in the beginning, you actually in the end think you should never use it, but that's not true. Uh, so you need to first attack and then get friends in this very, very specific uh, case that is deconstruction. Rudolf Gashi has an excellent understanding for that. He realizes that we have to use almost uh, God forbid to use that expression, Derrida wouldn't be too happy, but almost use deconstruction as criticism. But once you deepen it, once you get rid of this, you can be more flexible and lenient. And once you have enough lenience within yourself, enough flexibility, you can also accept it and see, see it as it is for what it is and use the why. Well, I think that's a good way of thinking it. When we have the why question, we have a possibility of choosing it. But if we don't have a why question, if this is sort of already there, already, dis uh, already uh, established, we can only have the what question. And what do we have on the level of the what question? Well, we all have almost only criticism. So although criticism is not a perfect understanding, it's good as a start and then you go deeper in. And uh, this is also valid for our sensory organs because by preemptively, and this is actually something Ashish Dalila pointed out three, four years ago, I, I could have no possibility of understanding it and I didn't even know that was a thing I didn't understand. But you might remember we spoke about ear, eyes, sensing organs. I even draw things here uh, pertaining to the ear, pertaining to the eyes, pertaining to the, um, to the senses, pertaining to taste, pertaining to smell. That's a way of discerning, making difference between the different sensory organs. And you can do that to a greater extent, and that was what they were doing, really making a difference between them. Because our normal way of doing it, it's too much of a polarity. We say that sight has nothing to do with smell, for instance, and vision, if you like, has nothing to do with hearing. But hearing and vision on a lower grade, when you go into the complexities, you understand to have dimensions, you need to have hearing. 
And this can be shown in a very interesting example from uh, sight and sensing. The little baby learns not depth of things by looking, but by touching. So even a blind child has a conception of depth by sensing. And one could say, and this is of course very exaggerated, that the very small baby sees everything two-dimensional, but is not far from the truth. How often haven't I seen a baby stretching for the moon or a chair that's like 10 meters away? They don't know depth. It's a learning thing. And why, I always thought to myself, should that learning stop somewhere? This is something we normally assume. And this is one of the limitations with this model. Because once you learned it, you stop learning. And the idea is, well, once you reach the age of 10, there's nothing more to learn about space. That was more or less the uh, opinion of René Descartes. But it's not true. Fractality is the real reality, so to speak. And that shows you will constantly learn about space. And one of the reasons I never figured it important to bring up space above me or behind me or around me was that I saw myself as a little dot in this three-dimensional thing here. So I thought I was localized anyway. I didn't have to do anything. Can you hear the passivity there? It's absolutely passive. And therefore, of course, I don't send anything outwards, upwards, backwards. I become desensitized. And that's a very good term because that will add her to the next level where we go to Alexander technique and memory learning because understanding that we become desensitized because we get stuck on one level. We stop making progress in dimensions after the year, 10 years old or 11 years old. We get stuck with that. No wonder it took us 900 lectures to sort of question it. It's a tough mission, but we got there. And I think that is the toughest step to do, because still when I think about fractality, I think fractality to be inside this box. And that's okay. That's a good way to start. Don't make it too difficult. And I sense more and more that the true character is fractal, but I still do this. It doesn't matter. It's okay to do it step by step. Because fractality is becoming more and more clear the more you train it. And when we get into memory, you will understand that the memory is too fractal. It's not zero or one. Matthias is indicating the indirectly this is one of the problems of conception of memory. The idea that either you remember or you don't. That is in itself a problem and might be the biggest problem. Because this is yet another one of those things. How often don't you hear people you ask them something, what happened two years ago uh, at the New Year's Eve party, and they say directly, I have no idea. Zero. That stops it. But if you try, you will get maybe a very crude idea. Think about the coast of Norway, and we take the measure of, uh, let's say, 50 kilometers. I think that's normal for a very crude map. Then you have an opening, you have a start at least. You have a very dim conception of what happened New Year's Eve two years ago. And it could actually be so dim, so the only thing you remember is the weather, that it was raining or something. But that's a start. But the other person who says, no, that stops there. That's where the buck stops. Learning to ease and up the one and the zero idea of memory is maybe the most important thing. Froebel points that out. The idea of one and zero is almost 
like a computer. And it's true within a computer. It has only either the computer remembers or doesn't. So you see, there's a living metaphor around us and that could make it, make it even harder. But try to loosen that up because once you're starting to understand, you have a vague understanding of almost everything. Your memory is not that gone. And the very idea of putting in, it into a linear order will also make it, make it harder to reach because it's already put in categories, stored away, far away, and in the end, it's only defined this way. And then the only information you can get out of uh, New Year's Eve two years ago, it was on Christmas two years ago. And that's not so complex, it's not so valuable. And I noticed that I actually used that for New Year's Eve two years ago. And the images was really vague. It was like nothing. The only thing I got first was me standing in a hallway or staircase. Uh, uh, and, uh, and then I realized I left the party to do some exercise. And that led me into, I could see uh, the corridor outside. And I remember an odd thing, which is so unimportant because the, my idea of what importance is, there could be, uh, imagine for instance that Kalle here holding the camera is a police officer and he questions me about the New Year's Eve two years ago. If he's too harsh and says, what happened inside the living room? And then he doesn't let me go from the staircase through the corridor to the living room. The fractality doesn't happen because he already established a polarity which is really high up and then the memory won't be reached. Oddly enough, I checked this up, this is not an integration method. Police are really aware of this. So they use a very lenient way and they let the person talk about personal memories, smells, sounds, things they seen. They ask them to describe the color of their shirt. You can wonder, what's that to do with the fix? It's opening up to fractality. And if you really want to remember something, you should add something to a memory you think is very important. And that should be of a very great complexity, like something that is extraordinary and sticks out. Then you add a hook to your memory position and it stays there. So you can go both ways. Also here you can gain in both ends. But what I do in this example, I see the corridor, I step back into the apartment and nothing really special happened that New Year's Eve two years ago. But I still remember it, which I think that is fascinating in itself. And uh, my looking for the more special things blocks out the special things. Now actually when I'm talking now, I do remember something that was extraordinary. And that was, I, for the first time in my life, I saw fireworks where they really cracked, where they exploded. Because it was on the very high up floor in a, in a very, very tall building. So when they were standing on the ground and send up the rockets, they exploded in front of the window and it was quite amazing actually. A bit scary, but that's the thing sticking out. Was I to search for the fantastic thing directly, I would not be able to reach because that memory is not very well stored. I took a note of it, but, but now I remember it. It was, it was rather amazing actually. Uh, and all of a sudden I understood uh, the people that invited me to the party, why it was so good to spend the party there, which I didn't understand. Until that very moment when they blow the rockets. So you see here, fractality is difference in a way. It's the ability to distinguish. It's the ability to make proper or better distinction. And the one level idea, everything being completely flat, one or zero, either marsupial or not marsupial, that limits knowledge preemptively, unnecessarily. And it limits it on my side, 
but it also limits it on the exogenous outside world because hey marsupials and mammals are really a part of the outside world they live there marsupials mostly in australia some in america opossum i think is a marsupial uh, in sweden i don't know even if we have any uh, but it doesn't matter really there are very few of them here but that's a place in the outer world so to speak and now we can make a clear difference between outside and inside but it's also changed within myself i open up more and i can use the marsupial mammal not directly as a parallel but the very process of going into fractality that is never the same so you learn fractality which you can use in other areas and this is why i say Fractality also points to sameness, that you can use thinking to make your body work better. Because what do I do when I take in space? I'm only thinking in one way. And uh, I have this problem with the group I'm working with, because they think still thinking is something very abstract, away from reality, it can't have an effect. So that's big part of my convincing efforts are thinking is important. Fractality really helps to understand that. All of a sudden you realize the scale independency and the outer inner, inner independency, which partly is there. Remember the Matryoshka. It means that thinking has actual effects and they are direct. Because when I take in space, things happen at that very instance. And it happens in my head. And although I can say the thoughts I are still the same. They are broadened. They are more fractal. And that also makes for very, sort of a, more of an energy to what I'm saying and thinking. And I started to feel a sharpness coming to my head sometimes. I get sharper in my thinking because the thinking too is something that can be sharpened. You can become clearer and therefore also what you say will become clearer so well later about that uh, uh, i think it's time for a break i say thank you very much and have a very pleasant afternoon bye bye thank you